I had this one of these dealers, her name was Terry. She was a fast moving chick, cocaine sniffer. She had a, bu a bunch of bartenders that she sold uh, cocaine to. She called me and said she wanted four ounces. I didn't think much of it. Of course, that was the red flag, but you know, I wasn't as sharp as I was years before. I was just not thinking. All I could think about is flip the drugs, make some money. And there was a rainy night. I went back down there with a friend of mine, and I met this gal at a, at a diner. And as we were talking, I felt a little strange, but there was nothing I could do. I was there already. I told her to go get the money. When she left, the diner i went back in the car to wait for the money about two minutes later there was four cars surrounded my car a bunch of detectives and agents arrested me and took me off and, and i was busted for a felony four ounces of cocaine welcome back to a lifetime of mafia tales i'm your host adrian martinez and of course i'm joined by my co-host salvatore polisi today sal goes into detail about the day he was busted by the feds for the last time sal shares how he was set up by a woman he was involved with then speaks about switching over to the other side and working with the fbi sal has completely changed his life around so feels it is only right to share this story about the true outcomes of crime please subscribe to this youtube channel for more interviews like this also please subscribe to our patreon channel for exclusive stories about Sal's life in the Mafia. All right, welcome back, everyone. Today, me and Sal are going to be talking about the day Sal was set up. We uh, haven't really talked much about that, and there's a lot of detail that goes into this episode. So please listen up, and well, without further ado, Sal, lead us into the story where you were set up. Um, as I think back, it's 40 years, just about 40 years ago in a few weeks. At the time, I thought it was the most terrible thing that could ever happen to me because, <laughs> uh, you know, I had a whole string of arrests. And I, at that point, because in 82, I had the uh, judge's case thrown out. For a couple of years, I was free as a bird. And I thought I had a bunch of money. I don't know. I had maybe six or $800,000 in, in baseball card boxes when I went upstate New York. And between 19, the fall of 81... In 1984, all that money was gone. I put it into that racetrack, um, not thinking that there was no way to make any money up there in the country. Yeah. And I didn't think I needed, you know, any money. But I did have, you know, some real estate that I had. I had some diamonds. But little by little, that stuff was being sold off. You know, the real estate was sold. The diamonds were sold. And I didn't have enough income. I mean, 40 years ago, the mortgage was 1500 a month. That was kind of a lot then. And, and I didn't have much money coming in. So, and I sold my Shylock loans to Funzi Terracone. I mean, I sold just everything I had thinking that I could go up there, build this racetrack and make some money. Little did I know there wasn't uh, enough racing to make any money. Uh, you know, in those days, if we had a bunch of racers come, they would pay $7 for the day to race. Today, it costs over $100 to race, a, to race a go-kart or a motorcycle. So whoever has a racetrack now can make some money. That racetrack is still there after 40 years. I went to visit last year with Karen, and the guy who owned it, you know, he uh, many times over said, thank you so much for your vision. But, you know, there was no money to be made for years and years. And today, uh, he, he probably makes several thousand dollars in one day there now. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He really took it to another level. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People pay a lot of money and they have, uh, you know, concession go-karts. Uh, he rents space out up there. You know, there's every possible way, you, you know, can make money in racing. He's got motorcycles and he's got go-karts and I think he has other events. But what I was facing in that spring was uh, we didn't have any extra money. Uh, the kids were in high school. Uh, my wife, Ro, had gotten a job local working in like a, a kitchen store. You know, she was selling kitchen appliances and kitchen accessories. And I was hanging around and I thought, well, this might be a good time to go back to the city. I still had friends in the drug business. But the drug business had changed. You know, the focus used to be in the 70s, heroin. But in the late 70s and the early 80s, everybody was interested in cocaine. 
And I had a connection to get cocaine, a Colombian connection if I wanted to. So I did go back there. I actually went and saw John Coniglia. He loaned me 25000 Just really? gave me 25000 Yeah, gave me 25000 Um, He was a good guy. I liked John a lot. He was different. You know, he did wind up going to jail for 50 years. I think he did 37 years. But he was an interesting personality. He was a pretty smart guy. I uh, had sold him a bunch of real estate. We were good friends, you know. Um, and then he charged me, I forget what it was, maybe 500 a week interest or something. And then I, as I was, as I borrowed the money, I used it to get a kilo. And I flipped that kilo, got another kilo. You know, months had gone by and I was making some money. I think I had given him back like 10 or 15,000. And in May of 70, of, Sorry, May of 84, I had this one of these dealers. Her name was Terry. She was a fast moving chick, cocaine sniffer. She had a, bu a bunch of bartenders that she sold uh, her, uh, cocaine to. And uh, she called me and said she wanted four ounces. I didn't think much of it. Of course, that was the red flag. But, you know, I wasn't as sharp as I was years before. I was just not <laughs> thinking. All I could think about is flip the drugs, make some money, you know. And there was a rainy night. I went back down there with a friend of mine, and I met this gal at a, at a diner. And as we were talking, I felt a little strange, but there was nothing I could do. I was there already. I told her to go get the money. When she left the diner, I went back in the car to wait for the money. About two minutes later, there was four cars surrounding my car, a bunch of, you know, detectives and agents arrested me and took me off. And, and I was busted for a felony, four ounces of cocaine. What was going through your head when you saw them all pull up like that? It was like, God, I was sleeping on this whole thing, you know? <laughs> I mean, I was up in the country for several years and never once saw any criminals, didn't talk to criminals, you know? Uh, but I wasn't on top of my game and there I was busted so this this famous very popular detective his name was Fran Francisini mm -hmm. he was an organized crime type of guy and you know I, I looked at him and I saw oh, this guy was straight as an arrow and I guess he he was pretty straight but for the guy he worked for the the uh, at that point was the uh, Queens district attorney he was known as hardcore well years later he wasn't so hardcore. He was a little bit corrupt himself. <laughs> but So I'm sitting in this office, and he brings me into another room. And in the room was a big board. And it was like triangular. You know, and it had like the heads, the names of each family with all these names of guys below. And, uh, you know, he pointed to, to the Gambinos, and there was Castellano at the top and Dela Croce on one side, and as he moved down with his finger, he'd go, here's your friend, John Gotti, you know. <laughs> and then he went over to where the Columbos were, he pointed to all these guys, and down the road a little bit was Cataldo, and I was right below him, right next to Cataldo. So he, they knew the whole structure of all of the mob families. They were just figuring out how to bust every one of them. But the government, like I said, they, they were doing a good job with the RICO cases, busting guys. Everything, everything had changed. Plus, that was an election year, 1984. Who was and, running? Uh, well, Geraldine Ferrara, she was running for vice president, Mondale Ferrara. Oh. And, of course, it was, it was Bush, you know. And, of course, they, they didn't win that election. But there was a lot of influence politically in and around Queens. It was very corrupt, Queens. Mm -hmm. If you had something to get done, you had to have contacts. Like Cataldo and I had this this judge that we could do business with, you know, we could reach him, pay the judge, get cases, not just our case, get cases thrown out, weaken the case, so, uh, you know, dismiss parts of the case. And then the prosecutors couldn't go forward. And of course the young prosecutors, when you're in, in a County like that, they come on young guys out of college. They're not very bright, you know, so there was a lot going on, the, you know, the judicial corruption. And so here I am busted. And I'm sitting in the cell. It was a rainy night that night. That's what I remember. I was all wet from being out in the rain. And 
once they busted me, they had me in the in the detective's room, and then, you know, they processed me, they fingerprinted me, they mugged me, and then, um, you know, they threw me in a in a cell somewhere, and I sat there all night. I want to say it was, I think it was a Monday or a Tuesday night, and then they processed me. I think the next day or so, and when I went to uh, the court a day or two later, the young prosecutor. He wasn't in charge of the case. They had an older prosecutor come along. And that guy requested a million-dollar bail, and the judge granted a million-dollar bail for a drug case. So I wasn't going anywhere. You know, I had to go back in uh, in the holding facility and wait to see if uh, my attorneys could get that bail reduced. Well, a couple of weeks went by, and he never got it reduced. It was still a million dollars. It was the summer of uh, 84, it was election year, and everybody was high and excited about, you know, busting guys for dealing cocaine. Maybe weeks later, as my family kept coming to visit me, I could see the torment that I had put them through. You know, they were upstate New York, 100 miles from New York City, isolated, you know. Yeah, they had to run the racetrack. We had, uh, you know, three or four races each month. But after May went by and June and July, I was up there and I was doing a lot of thinking. Am I going to continue this life? What can I do to bail out of the life? I didn't have the money. I mean, I had assets. You know, the, I had put in almost six or eight hundred thousand dollars in that racetrack. So I figured eventually I could sell it. But we had to get through month by month and the overhead was high. And my wife was selling all her jewelry. She had collected a bunch of jewelry over the years, you know. Eventually, um, I was sitting there with a Hispanic guy. I don't remember his name. And he said his wife had come in. And my two sons and, and Ro were sitting in a visiting room waiting to get in. And the two kids were crying. And he explained that to me, and that bothered me, you know. So we had the visit, and then I looked at my wife and I said, "Yeah, we're gonna. There'll be some changes going on." I had already gotten the idea that the way uh, to beat this cocaine case was probably contact the government and tell them about my connection to the judge in that building, which was this Judge Brennan. My, uh, and I mean, you could read the papers and see what was going on. Ed McDonald was a big name in organized crime as far as law enforcement. And I figured, well, if I could get to talk to him, I'll bet I would be a value to the government. So at this yeah. point, you were thinking of just only cooperating and getting the judge in trouble. Oh, yeah. yeah I had no intention of, of, you know, uh, testifying against anybody else about any criminals. I wasn't interested in flipping and testifying against criminals. So what I did was I called this... Ed McDonald? No, I called this probation officer. Hmm. His name was John Lembach, and he had been my probation officer. So when I called, he was in Brooklyn, located there. He wasn't a probation officer anymore. He had gone to ATF school, became an ATF agent. So um, I found out when he would be in his office, I got his phone number and I called again and I told him, come visit me. So he came to visit me. We went down into the visiting room for attorneys, not family, and we sat at the table. And he knew my whole history, by the way. Don't forget, this was 1984. And I had a case from 1978, 79, the car case. And I talked to him and said, look, I'm about done with this life. I need, I need to get out of this life. I need to move my family away. I know how this all works. I mean, I don't know all the detail, but if you go back and talk to Ed McDonald, you tell him that I had Judge Brennan, Cataldo, and I were able to pay him off for cases, to fix cases. The guy's face turned white. Really? Yeah, he couldn't believe I was telling this stuff, you know, because he knew me from the 70s. He saw he me had. when I, 
had my uh, auto, my Corvette shop. You know, he knew all my stories. He knew I was connected, uh, friendly to to Gotti and Cataldo and all these wise guys. Did so he know he that went, the the but, judge was corrupt at all at this it, point? Oh no, the, the government had notions. So, they they uh, had, you know, they had known that he was corrupt, but they couldn't get close enough to him, you know, to start a case. I mean, they had attorneys who were given information on the judge but and that had been going on for several years maybe back into the 70s but no one could ever get close so the way i heard it was he went back and sat down with mcdonald you know this was like august of 84 and i hadn't heard any of this stuff two months and months later but anyway um then i had mcdonald's phone number and i used to call him and say hello, you know, and he said, well, when you get out, we'll talk, you know. Uh, the reason I had his number was, you know, if I wanted to talk to my wife, I would have to call upstate New York collect. It was some ridiculous charge for the phone call, but I would call his secretary and she would patch me through to my wife's phone number. <laughs> and the government wow. would pay for that phone call, you know. <laughs> just because I was in jail, I wasn't, you know, sitting there on my butt. I mean, I had ways to get around things, you know. Anyway, uh, eventually we got the bail down to like, I want to say a quarter of a million dollars and a hundred thousand dollar cash. Well, I had a stash on the property, but I couldn't tell anybody where that stash was. It wasn't a bunch of money. It was drugs and other stuff. Hmm. But eventually my wife sold off a whole bunch of stuff and out of the blue, one of the guys that worked for us on the racetrack, because we had, you know, employees that would come every every Saturday and Sunday. His mother was an older woman. Her name was Zelda Green. She would come up to the races and meet and visit with her son. He was living up there. He was going to marry a, a local girl in upstate New York. And after the races, everybody would leave. And uh, in the late summer, Ro would sit on the deck, smoke. She was a smoker. And she was sitting there crying when the woman walked up. And the woman knew Ro. She had a son named Jeff, Jeff Green. I, I always wished I could have talked to Jeff or his mother. I don't even know if his mother's alive. And we were short about 25,000 on, on 100,000 cash. We needed 100,000 cash. And the woman said to Ro, how are you? How are you doing? She knew I was busted and being held you know, on a high bail. She, so Rose said, yeah, we just can't seem to get all the money together. We scraped together, you know, almost 70000 and we're, you know, short. And she says, well, how much do you need? And Rose said, probably 30000 to get them out more. She said, well, I'm going home. She lived in Staten Island. I'm going home and talk to my husband and I'll call you tomorrow. So the woman out of the blue called Rose and said, look, I have a check for 30000 for you. What? Really? Yeah. yeah mm. I didn't know this woman. Just was the, she like a close friend or anything? No, the no. The kid, her son worked for us. He was a nice guy. I treated him nice and he liked the, the family. Oh. So she gave Rose the $30,000 check. Rose called our attorney and uh, put all the money together, called for a bail hearing. And we deposit. They deposit a hundred thousand, and I was out. It was like maybe, oh, a few days before the Labor Day of 1984, and it was the summer of '84. And ironically, in Port Jervis, New York, there was two kids who were who were wrestlers, and the Olympics had just completed, and they both won Olympic gold medals. Damn. So the town of Port Jervis was giving them a parade, and then behind you know, the, the float that they were riding on, they had the football team walking behind and my son was on the football team. So we went to this Labor Day parade. Now, it had been a few months and there was a lot of stories up there, a lot of gossip about one of the kids on the football team. His dad was a drug dealer because this was upstate New York. It was very, you know, low key. There wasn't any criminals living up there. And Just um, you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and right about that time, I, after I got out, I was only out a few days. I had an appointment to meet McDonald. Mm -hmm. 
So the guy who was my probation officer would call me and say, okay, look, you know, next Tuesday, you got to come down. I'll give you the, the address of this motel hotel. We're going to meet in Yonkers, New York. He said, I'm coming with my boss. He was an ATF then. Once someone makes a contact with a possible confidential informant or witness, they stay on, they stay on as representing the case, you know. Of course, there was no government case, but I agreed to go meet. So Roe and I drive down to Yonkers. It probably was after about a couple of weeks I had gotten out. I think I got out maybe the middle of August or maybe late August of 84. And now it's right after Labor Day. So we go down to this uh, hotel, motel, whatever it was. I don't remember the name of it. And I said to Roe, well, you might as well wait here. I don't know how long I'm going to be. I go up and I meet McDonald. Don't forget, this is 40 years ago. And he was very straight, straight laced guy. You know, this is, uh, this was right after the, the, the uh, good fellas, you know, all the, the news. And, uh, of course there was no movie of good fellas. It was just Henry, all the news he had Henry made, you know, and, uh, he was, he got Henry, you know, put into the witness protection program. And of course, nobody knew much about that. That was very secretive. Nobody knew who McDonald really was. Once in a while, his name would show up in the paper. But he was a big part of investigative agency going after the mob. So we sat down and we started talking. We talked for hours and hours. And he said, look, this is a very, very difficult case trying to get, you know, trying to get a judge convicted of, of bribery. And yes, it is a federal case. And I don't know what I can do, but I'm going to have to introduce you to the FBI and you're going to have to meet with them. So maybe a couple of days later, I get a call from that guy, uh, the ATF agent. His name was John Limbach. And he says, OK, you got to come down and meet at such and such a place. I'm going to introduce you to this FBI agent. So I go to this meeting. I don't know that the FBI agent had just received the Brennan investigative material. For years, they were after Brennan, okay? But he did tell me that he inherited this investigation. And what I didn't know was, you know, the government can focus on someone if they think they have information of corruption or bribery or whatever, but they have to little by little prove that there's enough what they call PC, probable cause, to go further into the investigation. He said, this is a very, very difficult case. And the former agents, former FBI agents that had the case for years couldn't get close enough to Brennan. He said, if you think you can get us close to Brennan, we may be able to authorize this investigation. What I didn't know was it was all done in steps. You know, I don't just say, okay, let's go after this corrupt judge. They have to present a lot of evidence to the U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney has to present it to the Justice Department because you're not talking about the average citizen or a possible mob guy. You're talking about a sitting Supreme Court judge. That's a big deal. And it was a big deal to them. So little by little, you know, uh, I was being schooled on how to get closer to this judge because the closer we got and then they also knew who the judge's cronies were and so because i would you know had the possibility of meeting this guy bruno who was the judge's bag man back in the 70s he owned a restaurant a popular restaurant nightclub in new york but he had left new york and went to florida opened up a new nightclub down there a nicer nightclub and I was able to get Dominic Cataldo was already in jail. By the way, he was on his way to doing, I don't know, 100 years with the Persico, uh, you know, the Persico organized crime convictions that they had. And I had his brother Joey, which was my son Joe's godfather, call that guy Bruno and say, hey, a friend of ours wants you to, wants you to have a meeting with him. When he's going to fly down. Could you meet with him? So Bruno said, yeah. 
Now, I knew that Bruno was their connection, that Cataldo would give the money to Bruno previously, and then Bruno would pass it on to the judge, you know. But all of this is not so easy because the government has to have every detail of the escalation of that case. And the things that they needed, I had to help them provide, which was getting closer to this guy, Bruno. So after maybe, I don't remember, maybe a couple of weeks or a month, uh, I had to take a lie detect test with the feds. They had to sit me down and I had to explain what my connection to, to Bruno and Brennan was years earlier, like back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And so I went through every possible question. I never lied to the feds. What I knew was once they, once they caught you in a lie, there was no credibility for you. And they, you weren't going to be a usable witness like what happened to Castle. He kept lying to the government. So they realized he didn't have any real value. I mean, there was nothing credible about Casso. It was, and and the guy killed so many people. He wasn't going to be a good government witness. Now, with Sammy Gravano killing nineteen people, they figured, look, it, it couldn't get any worse. But he was close enough to Gotti that years later they used him, you know, uh, on the Gotti case. But when people realize how competent, how capable, and how um, conflicting some of this can be. You have to really show the government that you are telling the truth. So, I mean, I gave them all the details. I gave them all the truth. And they had a thousand questions for me. And then finally, uh, it was maybe October, November. After a few months of meeting, I had uh, wired up against my old attorney, Mike Coro, who was also Gotti's attorney. And there was conversations that were, you know, beneficial to the government. And they were allowed... Each time they had to, you know, get authorization to go further. Then by the time the turn of the year came, uh, the guy, Brandon and Bruno, were down in Florida. And this was the opportunity to go down there and meet the Brennan, uh, the Bruno guy, the bag man. And Brennan was there. He used to go down there two weeks, I think January, February of each year, and go to the racetrack and hang out. They were friends forever. And now the government was convinced that I was telling the truth. And then they just needed more evidence that the, that this judge was going to fix my case. Well, at the same time, I didn't know what the FBI was doing. They got into the Queens courthouse and they got people to give them information. And the people that gave them the information never once told the judge. They were scared. They were scared to, you know, to, to reveal that they had given information to the FBI. But all the evidence, this guy Russo, Dan Russo was the FBI agent. He had compiled all this evidence. And then finally, Bruno agreed to take, he take, gave me a number, $25,000. He agreed to take the 25000 and give it to the judge. By that time, we they had, the FBI had bugged, they had bugged uh, the judge's, hotel room. They had all kinds of information, phone calls going back and forth. I think the biggest thing that happened was at that point, the judge, I had a different judge in the Queen's Supreme Court, but the judge had his secretary go into the file room and get my file, my case, and sign it out. And he looked at it and they put it back. Once that was established, they knew that he had no business looking at my case. So all this little evidence added up. And eventually when I went back, I believe in February, and gave the 25000 to that guy Bruno, he told the judge, uh, you know, the guy's for real. He's, he, you know, he wants you to fix his case. Of course, a lot of this was already documented by the feds. You know, some of that stuff that was on the, the, uh, Ubat's documentary is the original recordings, which you could use these, those. You could put that, you can involve that and stick it into this, this interview, you know, mm -hmm. what was going on. It was very complicated. I didn't understand all the legal, uh, the legal ramifications of, you know, going after a sitting judge. But at the same time, it had a big effect on my family. Um, you know, I was still in New York City, tooling around, waiting for when they 
going to arrest the judge. And then <clears throat> the judge figured out he was being surveilled. He was being watched by the feds because he had a detective go over and flash the bed and say, who are you guys sitting over here outside this house or whatever? And they had to identify themselves as FBI agents. So <laughs> the judge knew something was coming. Once yeah. that happened, yeah, once that happened, they picked up my family and myself and they moved us up to Buffalo, New York for several weeks. And they made the arrest of Bruno and the judge, which was front page, front page news. It was on the New York Post and, you know, daily news. It was, you know, big, pretty big news that he was involved with the mob. So that was in early 86. Well, they moved this around from Buffalo uh, to Washington, D.C., getting us ready to go into the witness protection program, which is not done overnight. You got to go through a whole bunch of interviews and, you know, they got to examine your life. And it was all hard on my family. It was much harder on them because I knew I wanted to bail out of that life. In the meantime, I still had this case that was pending in Queens. And it was up to McDonnell to figure out how the Queens district attorney could dismiss that drug case. And then the government was going to create a drug charge against me, which is the most bizarre thing you ever heard about. <laughs> but they did pull that off. They yeah. got Queens to dismiss the case. And then the government created a drug case when I signed my agreement to become a witness. Well, that whole summer of 86 went by and then uh, I had a meeting and I did testify against the judge. He got convicted. Um, and I lived through 1985, whereas the Castellano hit took place in Christmas time, you know? And right after that, in the early 86, that same prosecutor who handled the Brennan case called me and it flew me up to Minnesota or I think it was Michigan for a secret meeting and said, we have a Gotti case and you're going to be the first witness. I had no clue that I signed an agreement to be a witness at any federal trial that they deemed uh, potentially possible to use me as a witness. And everything had already began to change there. So at that point, you know, I had to go back and testify against Gotti in the Gotti trial. There was just so much that went on. You know, it was just month by right. month by month. Uh, and, and it did tear up my family, you know. But the kids were in high school. They're getting ready to go to college. And uh, I testified, I believe, in the fall of 86 on that first, the first Gotti case where I talked about it on that Netflix documentary. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I told everybody that uh, there was no question in my mind Gotti was going to find a way to fix the jury. And, of course, you know, the government laughed. They, they, they laughed at it, but I think they underestimated who he was. Right. Well, see, when we go over to Patreon, we'll talk more about how the effect was on your family and the yeah. different locations that they sent you to throughout the witness protection program. But Right, right. I mean, that, that pretty much does cover your, your the whole time that you were set up up until going into the witness protection program and having <laughs> right. to do all kinds of different stuff. But that is pretty interesting how it all went down. And uh, we've never talked about it or covered it till now, but there was a lot of detail that went into that and a lot of the stuff that. Oh, yeah. That there's a lot of just a lot of things that were in there that needed to be talked about, I suppose. But now looking back on it, I mean, how do you feel about being set up and stuff? Well, you, I mean, do you feel you it know, needed it was, to happen? Yeah. To me, it was probably the best thing that happened. It forced yeah. me to go straight, you know. And I never once uh, got involved in any drugs or any crime. Didn't know any criminals when I got to Texas. I mean, that was that's another story, how they dropped us off in the middle of Texas, you know, right. uh, to live in a witness protection program. I mean, that was in the 80s. And little did we know the government had dropped off other guys in Texas. I think there was a guy there who uh, was in the program that wound up either getting killed or hanging himself. Uh, there was all kinds of things that was going on. None of this was public. You know, you got to remember in the 80s, there, there was no internet. So none of this stuff got out. And it took a long time for people to figure out what was going on in New York versus the rest of the country. Of course, once we got into the 90s, 
people started reading about the life. Uh, and then 1990, Goodfellas came out and everybody was totally fascinated, you know, with, uh, with organized crime. Oh yeah. No, that, that's for sure. When after it all, all the movies and stuff came out, but yeah. I think we're at a good wrapping up point for this episode. Now we're going to go over to Patreon. So thank you everybody for watching. And if you haven't seen our other, previous episodes, you can check them out on just by going to the YouTube channel and then going to the playlist. And then we got a Lifetime of Mafia Tales. There's about 40 plus episodes on there. And then on our live shows, you can find there's about another 30 plus on there as well. So it's around 70, getting up there to 80. So check them out if you haven't seen them. We got plenty of them. And thank you again. And we'll see you on the next one. I hope you all learned something from today's story about Sal getting set up and working with the feds. Sal was ready to leave the mafia life at this point in time, and he went all in. He changed his mindset from being a drug dealer to working with the FBI. That had to hit all of his friends and families with a shock when they found that out. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel for more videos from me and Sal. And if you want exclusive stories about Sal's life in the Mafia, please subscribe to our Patreon channel. The links for those are in the video description below. I know if you enjoyed this podcast that I did with Sal today, you'll enjoy my other podcast called Invest in Yourself Podcast. On that podcast, I interview ex-mobsters, ex-gangsters, former drug addicts, former alcoholics, all kinds of different people from all kinds of different types of life, and they all face adversity and they overcome it. And if you enjoyed this podcast, I know you'll enjoy that one for damn sure. So please go ahead and check it out. All you got to do is look up the Invest in Yourself podcast. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify, any podcast directory you can think of. Thank you again so much for watching. And of course, we'll see you on the next one. If you would like to support our podcast, we got a few items that you can purchase. All of these items can be found in the video description below. The first one is Sal's book, The Sinatra Club. You can get this personally autographed by Sal. The next one and our hottest seller is the 1972 Sinatra Club playing cards. Back in Sal's Mafia days, he opened up his own social club named the Sinatra Club. Many mobsters would come to this club, even when there were all-out wars going on between different families. They would come to the Sinatra Club and play cards. Some of the mobsters that played with these cards were John Gotti, Dominic Cataldo, Tommy Simone, Foxy, Jimmy Burke, Willie Boyd Johnson, Tony Roach, Henry Hill, Joe Defiti, Danny Fatico, Gene Gotti, Peter Gotti, Joey Scopo, and many more. We're selling each one of these cards for $10 a piece. These cards are limited, we only got a thousand of them. The next item is an autographed picture of Sal from his Mafia days. Another item is the Dinner with the Mobster card. You can get this autographed as well. This was an event that Sal had hosted in the past. We also got the Ubots production ticket from an event that Sal had hosted. This is also autographed. The last item we got to offer is Sal's book, The Sins of the Father. Again, you can find all these items in the video description below.